Good day, everyone. So this is the supplement to our norm reference assessment module. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to show some examples of using norm reference tests across multiple age ranges, just to make sure we're covering all our bases. So we're going to start early childhood into elementary and then into secondary. Uh, we're going to elaborate on the value added from norm reference tests and then how we can complement norm reference test data with other types of data. I always find it's helpful to uh, show how these concepts apply in actual practice and in your day-to-day -day lives. So let's get started. So let's go ahead and get started with our first case of the day, early childhood. So you've received a report from the birth to three team stating that this child is minimally verbal, says about five words, so not really talking very much, and that they've really been working on nonverbal requests, and he's made quite a lot of progress. So you decide to give the PLS 5 and observe that there is a total language score of 65. So the next question is, is that a significant discrepancy from his peers? And so we can look to the manual. They state with a cut score of 85, uh, sensitivity of 91, specificity of 80. There's been a fair amount written about this. There's some criticisms. But in general, I think we can look at this and say, uh, you know, a 65 is well below an 85. And at that level, it already had good sensitivity. So very likely a significant discrepancy. I also like to use the general rubric uh, that DPI provides for interpreting different tests and triangulating data. Uh, so where we can find this, what I usually do is I just Google uh, Wisconsin DPI SLI for the speech language impairment. And then when I go there, they have the assessment tools for speech uh, or language impairment. And then if we go down to the assessment of language section, you can see the rubric for considerations for language impairment. I really like this form. I'll talk about it several times today. It's kind of buried a bit on the page, uh, but it's fairly easy to find once you know what you're looking for. Uh, so this is what the rubric has. And what we see is on the rightmost column, there's speech language pathology, norm reference tests and measures. And we can look at this and the guidelines provided. We know that our students scored a 65. And we see that all the way at the bottom, the bottom right, uh, a general rule of thumb is a standard score of 69 or below is a substantial impact. Now, I realize that this is not, uh, you know, looking at the individual differences between tests and the sensitivity and specificity for each individual test. But this can give us a, a, a general guideline, general rule of thumb that we are noticing a substantial impact on this test. And we know this clinically as well, right? We have a student who scores a 65. That's quite low and quite the significant discrepancy. So let's take a look at some of the items that our students got correct. So uh, on the PLS, you can uh, have caregiver report, observation, or elicitation. And so we uh, elicited uh, symbolic gestures by uh, doing different basic gestures, waving by, clapping hand, moving body. So, uh, you know, setting up a situation where we can try to get the student to do these different types of activities. We also observed that uh, he was using at least one word. Looking at some of the receptive items, we saw that he was able to follow uh, simple directions, familiar routines with uh, some gestural cues. So he was able to put a ball in a box, throw a ball, give keys, um, you know, those types of basic activities with some cueing. When we look at things that he did not get correct, uh, he was not identifying photographs, he wasn't comprehending some basic verbs, wasn't naming photos. Uh, and was using words uh, uh, infrequently. So more often he was using gestures to communicate than words. So when giving the PLS, did we learn anything new? So let's think about what we learned with this test. We learned that there is a significant discrepancy, a significant discrepancy between his overall language skills and his peers. Uh, we did get to observe some early developing gesture and play skills, and uh, we observed that he has a small vocabulary. 
Now, getting back to the question, is any of this new? So we, if we got good information from the birth to three team, and we can trust that information, I don't think there was a lot new here. We knew he had a pretty small vocabulary. We knew he was able to do some nonverbal requests. Uh, so we knew he was communicating, but uh, did appear to have uh, quite a delay in his overall language and, and speech skill. So we can also think about the value that the PLS added. Maybe it's a good place to start. Uh, that's certainly a valid point. Uh, tests like the PLS give us lots of opportunities to elicit communication and observe communication. It's very usable. Uh, we did get confirmation that there is that significant discrepancy and it pre presented in a way that many IEP teams will be comfortable with. Uh, you know, our IEP teams are familiar with tests like the PLS that give standard scores and percentiles uh, and really document and confirm that there is a significant discrepancy and a delay in overall communication skills. We can think about what we're missing with the PLS. So, you know, how does having a small vocabulary and an inability to follow directions how does that impact his ability to access and engage with the curriculum and with his peers? And then looking around at his overall communication needs, what are some of the most pressing needs that could use help through interventions? So one place we could look to understand that better and go in more depth is with academic standards. So the Weemuls are broken down by different performance standards. So this is looking at a uh, range of emotions. It has a continuum that shows us what we expect earlier in development and later in development, sample behaviors and sample strategies. So these are uh, things that we could look at for emotions. We also have uh, things that we can look at for social interactions and play. Uh, and so these are going to be very relevant for us as S and then next we have speaking and communicating standards. We're gonna spend some more time on these. So let's take a look at that developmental continuum. So uh, the lower level, just simply seeking attention using vocalizations. Uh, then more advanced is trying to more actively direct adults' attention. Uh, and then even more advanced, engaging in short dialect dialogue and then taking listeners' perspectives. And we can look at some different examples of behaviors. These earliest behaviors are a, a lot of physical manipulation of the environment, um, you know, kind of basic requests to uh, get attention. And a simple strategy is responding to children's actions and vocalizations, responsivity. Actually a very nice evidence-based uh, type of intervention. Uh, there's a lot of work on uh, an approach called pre-linguistic milieu therapy, and that's essentially what this is. Setting up the environment to promote communication and being highly responsive to children's attempts at vocalizations or, or and, and attempts at communication. Uh, then, you know, looking at a bit more advanced, so more advanced types of communication, pointing, combining with words and vocalizations, Strategies would be expanding and extending what children uh, vocalize and state and request. And then we see into, uh, you know, dialogue, into more advanced, uh, you know, trying to take uh, listeners' perspective and engage them in broader, deeper conversations. So looking at the Weemels, you know, is this really an assessment? Is it academic standards? What is it? Well, these are academic standards, but I believe they can really inform our assessment. So when we do interviews with educators and parents, uh, we can refer back to the Weemels or even use the Weemels to uh, generate questions and just conversations to have with other stakeholders. I also think it can really help, uh, again, either helping us link our different assessments to the curriculum or as a starting place for some different types of assessment uh, using more quote unquote informal or more appropriately named criterion reference assessments uh, you know doing a language sample something like a play-based language sample and seeing what types of uh, behaviors we're observing trying to elicit these different types of key early behaviors and communication skills or even a dynamic assessment so taking a look at uh, these standards again with that lens, 
if we think about a criterion reference assessment, what we're trying to do is say, are children meeting these different criteria and where do they stand? Now, one of the crit critiques of the Weemels is that they don't have ages that go along with each of these different spots on the developmental continuum. I would say that we as SLPs, that's where we can really add value uh, to the educational team is by either combining this with some of our other assessment documents or even just using some of the resources we can find, ASHA uh, milestones, ages and stages questionnaires, information from the CDC, you know, any of those developmental milestones that we can easily access or we have good knowledge of can help us interpret where our students are at and what their next steps should be. I also want to talk briefly about how these could be incorporated into a dynamic assessment. So I'm not familiar of, you know, any published formal dynamic assessment of early intentional communication, but DPI, again, on its website, provides a very usable, convenient guidance tool on dynamic assessment. And just to show you uh, one of the main features of this is how we interpret our dynamic assessments. Uh, so, you know, are, uh, are students highly modifiable, uh, you know, intermediately modifiable or have low modifiability? And the way we estimate that is we set up a situation where we provide different levels of support and we want to see how much effort did it take us to teach the student, how responsive was the student to the different levels of support, and how much did their knowledge or skills transfer to the skill that we're looking at. So if we're looking at early communication skills, um, you know, maybe we would uh, try to uh, get a greater range of communication functions or combining uh, intentional communication with vocalizations or different vocabulary. So we could set up a situation where we're providing different levels of support, something we do every day as an SLP, uh, and then see did it take us low effort or much higher effort to help them with that skill? Were they highly responsive and you know show changes to the way they communicate or have a low level of responsivity? Now, even though there aren't a lot of published dynamic assessment tests available for us, it has been studied quite a bit. Now, my goal in showing you this is not to state that this is a process or procedure that should be used, but just to show how dynamic assessment can look and then also some evidence supporting it. So in this study, they looked at dynamic assessment of early communication functions. And what they did was called a graduated prompting task. My main goal in this is to show you, show you that these are the types of things we do all the time as SLPs. You know, look at independent performance and look at performance with different levels of, uh, of support. So looking at receptive language, you know, just a simple prompt would get a score of three. If they had to give a bit more prompting, it would go down to two. If they gave even more prompting, and the student gets it right, they'd give a score of one. If they gave a very high level of prompting and they still get it incorrect, then they get a score of zero. And you can see how that aligns with that, those arrows that I showed before, you know, minimal versus max effort, minimal versus max responsivity. And they did this for several different aspects of early communication. Uh, also looking at turn taking, right? So just a very no cue, uh, very much a no cue of handing a ball and uh, to the child fo following the child's turn. So just, you know, normal turn taking behavior, uh, using a verbal prompt of my term, using a physical plus a verbal prompt and a repetition, uh, or, you know, uh, lots and lots of prompts with no responsivity. And they also did this for social requesting as well. Um, so if we look at the different types of speaking and communicating behaviors that we're looking at, we could think about what are different ways that we could provide additional support. So for example, maybe we're seeing that the child has quite a few words, uh, quite a few core vocabulary words, um, but isn't combining those with communication, with, uh, with, with those requests and different attempts. So these are some of those higher level types of skills of coordinating uh, communication with your verbalizations. So could we try out some of these levels of, uh, of, of 
communication and see what happens if we give small or moderate or even high levels of support and how responsive the student may be. So to summarize, I'd like to think, you know, was the PLS necessary? I think we got more valuable information with some of those uh, criterion reference assessments, academic standards, dynamic assessments, really getting more in depth to where the student was. I think we didn't really learn a lot with the PLS uh, because we knew that this student had a significant communication delay. Now that said, it may be very necessary uh, from your perspective or within your district or within your team to really have that confirmation uh, and that number that shows that there's a true communication delay, a significant discrepancy. Now, what would we lose without the PLS? I think we would mainly lose that score, right? I don't think we got in-depth information on vocabulary, known vocabulary, used types of communication. I think to get that more in-depth information, that's where we can really go to our standards, our criterion reference assessments, language samples, and uh, different types of dynamic assessments to get that in-depth information. All right, so moving on, we're gonna go to case two, a second grader giving that test you know that I talked about in uh, the, the last module. And we could say that you gave it yourself just to kind of give you a hint of what this test is. And the core language score is an 81. Now, if we think back to that last module, uh, we talked about sensitivity and specificity. And we observed that the best sensitivity and specificity with, was a standard score cut of 80. So what happens when we get this in-between type of score of an 81? We know that the uh, standard error of measurement is roughly two to three. So, you know, we're kind of in that in-between area. There's some level of error within our measures. How do we interpret this? Uh, so, you know, how do we move forward? Should you give another standardized norm reference test? Maybe that's what you've been told. Okay, he's getting a little uh, over ambitious with uh, these little jokes here, uh, but really that's not a best practice. It's, uh, you know, if you give another norm reference test, if they're both quality tests appropriate for your student, you're very, very likely to get the same type of result if you have differences, they can be very difficult to interpret. So you wanna give the best test that you know is available and really interpret that uh, if you're getting good valid data. Now, if we look back here to our language rubric, uh, we see that the standard score of 80 would fall into this range between 77 and 84, which is minimal impact. So we might say, well, that means that uh, this student would not qualify for services, right? If it's minimal impact. However, we can't base any of our decisions on one piece of data. We have to look at a comprehensive evaluation. If we see most of the other areas are in this no impact to minimal impact, then it may be more compelling that this student does not have a language or speech or language disability and doesn't qualify for services. If we see more moderate to substantial impact in these other, other areas, then uh, this child would have communication needs that are impacting uh, his education and would need to be addressed. So what I'm gonna do next is go through two different hypothetical results. Uh, show how these data could show either qualification for special education under speech and language or no qualification, uh, no true speech language impairment. So let's start with no true speech language impairment. We may do a, a review of academic testing and see that he's in the 15th to 25th percentile. So, you know, lower end on the, the normal distribution, but uh, not in that lowest end. And we see that he, you know, just enjoys school. Uh, he is eager to participate. He shows up to class. Uh, he's relatively happy to learn and engaging well with the now, if we give a narrative language sample, we may see that his MLU is a bit low. That would be consistent with the score on the self. Uh, plot's a bit underdeveloped. If we do a dynamic assessment and try some different levels of support, we may observe that there really isn't a lot of effort to teach him, that he's responsive to the teaching. 
you know, maybe moderate level of responsiveness is going to take him a bit more, but he's engaged and responsive and interested in those types of supports. Uh, you know, during the evaluation meeting or during our interviews, we may observe that the parents have a good s support system in place. Uh, and really, you know, they want what's best and they're, they're comfortable if that means speech or no speech, whatever the team can do to best support his needs is what they're looking for. So let's contrast that with uh, uh, result number two, where we're seeing a true speech or language impairment. We may observe below the fifth percentile on academic testing. Uh, you know, difficulty getting to school, requiring a lot of the teacher's effort and attention in order to get his needs met in the classroom. Uh, we may see also a, a low MLU on the narrative sample, but just overall low engagement with the narrative task, you know, really requires a high amount of effort, a lot of prompting for you to get another story out and a very low level of responsiveness. You know, during the evaluation meeting, we may learn about multiple types of stresses that the parents are feeling, uh, really a, a limited understanding of how to help him and, and similar types of stress and worry within the classroom. You know, the teachers tried some things, but they're just not working and, and doesn't really where, know where to go next to uh, help the student get his needs met. So you may be saying, John, come on, is that the real world, you know? Doesn't a test say whether or not a child has a language disorder or a language disability? Fascinating, great article just came out uh, in Language, Speech, and Hearing Services in the schools. This is open access, freely available for you to get. Uh, and they looked at standardized norm reference tests and their relationship with more functional outcomes. Uh, so what they found, they, they had this really nice summary. I know it's a bit fuzzy, but I want to show you this uh, on Carla McGregor's social media site. She has great summaries of the research. So this first point here, what they learned is that all children with language disorders have impaired language, right? So I think it'd be fair to say, based on the research definition, this child has a language disorder. There's that significantly low performance on a standardized test, but how that impacts academic achievement, social interaction, household responsibilities, and community involvement, it varies. It varies across all children with language disorders. And it's not related necessarily to scores on tests of language, on language tests, right? So if you do well on a test, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that you're going to have adequate functioning. Similarly, if you have a low score on a test, that doesn't mean that you're going to have a disability and, and difficulty functioning. So they did find there were some different risk factors that were related to reduced functioning. So lower nonverbal ability, having multiple needs, multiple health conditions, uh, you know, some of the environmental characteristics, caregivers with fewer years of education, uh, you know, and factors that improved function, uh, the, the issues that within the student themselves, their self-agency, uh, desire to help others, positive role models, and access to caring adults. Okay, so I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that we need to have our decisions fully based on how caring the adult is uh, or years of education. The main point of this is to recognize that standardized norm reference tests alone do not tell us the impact of a language disability on functioning. And really to get that full picture, we need to go beyond our norm reference tests and understand uh, how the student is functioning in their day-to-day -day life. So on to our final case, a case of a high school student. Uh, so this student, she received services since preschool uh, and we're noting continue, continued social communication needs. Uh, so maybe you give that test you know, uh, and you borrowed it from the other building because they're not selfish. Gosh, I thought he was done with these silly jokes. Uh, but anyway, with the self, we observe a core language score of 106. So well within the normal range, no significant discrepancy there. So I went down to our test cabinet and saw what we had. We have the test of pragmatic language. Uh, so that seems like it could be appropriate in this case. I did a little digging in the test manual 
and didn't really find a lot of information. Um, you know, there was some reliability, validity, but no sensitivity and specificity. It didn't tell us how well this identifies kids with certain types of diagnoses or profiles. Now, it did show how groups of kids, how groups of students uh, with different types of uh, descriptions performed as a group. So we see kids who were deemed gifted and talented scored a bit above the mean. Uh, kids with ADD scored a bit below. Uh, and they also looked at uh, kids with learning disabilities, uh, emotionally disturbed or language disorders, but really no um, social communication, pragmatic needs, um, uh, autism without language disorder or anything like that. So we can look at some of the items. These are generally hypotheticals and abstract language. So this first one talks about Matt and having a teacher that he thinks is going to be mead. Uh, and his dad says, you can't judge a book by its cover. We have to know and explain what he means by that. And then also, how is a roadmap like a recipe? And we have uh, responses for that. Now, when I read through these, a lot of these are looking more at abstract language, complex language, and, you know, certainly hypotheticals. Um, but I, I think a lot of times these tests, they don't pick up on the the pure social communication needs of our students. They can often uh, talk about hypotheticals all day, uh, but then when it goes to actually using uh, um, pragmatics and social language, it can be a different story. So here we see a standard score of 98. So again, that uh, standard score is well within the normal range. So now we could also uh, review the existing data and we could see that uh, the caregiver shared some uh, information from her medical record, diagnoses of anxiety and uh, OCD. Uh, she did get services throughout much of uh, preschool and elementary school for uh, phonological disorder and then a speech sound disorder or articulation disorder, and then also some help with pragmatics. Also noted some selective mutism during periods uh, of elementary school. So now thinking about interview and observation, I'm going to share some information that one of the SLPs in our community of practice shared. I thought it was really clever and a great insight into social communication needs. Uh, so this SLP, she sent surveys uh, to all of the different teachers to identify those teachers and classes where there are concerns. And then within those classes uh, where concerns were noted, doing an observation. And uh, what this SLP shared is that uh, within this class, one of the key grades was based on uh, second language conversations with peers, right? So if we have someone with social communication needs, they may have great proficiency in a second language, uh, but if they're being evaluated and judged uh, based on uh, you know, conversations with peers, that could interfere with their ability to show their competence. You could also collect a persuasive language sample, which is a great way to see how students are using their higher level language skills. And with this case, we may observe good MLU, good ability to provide supporting details. However, some difficulty with counter arguments. So being able to anticipate and respond to counter arguments. And that could let us see some of the more finer aspects of uh, persuasive dis discourse that are difficult for this student. So when we're thinking about this case, uh, we want to think about, you know, what are her communication needs? So which tests added value in identifying these communication needs? I think those standardized norm reference tests, especially the self, did add some value. We saw that there really is no notable substantial language disorder that is a root cause for her social communication difficulties. I don't know that the test of pragmatic language added that much. Um, you know, we saw that she was within the normal range, but when we were looking at some of the more functional aspects of uh, her social communication, it was the more authentic curriculum-based assessments that picked up on that. We can think about how her needs could be served. Uh, you know, is it us as the speech language pathologist who can help address those needs? Or they, could those needs be met somewhere else? 
is there any type of duplication of services? So really looking at the team that's available and who could best meet those needs without having duplication of services. So what we would like you to do, there's no community of practice this week. There's no official application activity where you know we're going to have you try out assessments, but we do have a few different questions for you to think about. Uh, we'd like you to think through uh, these different cases and anything that connected with you and anything you may do differently. We'd also like you to think about one of your past cases and you know just after reflecting on some of the topics in this presentation, is there anything you would change? And then finally thinking about uh, times and situations where you may forego norm reference testing. So is it ever appropriate to not do any norm reference testing? And even if you could skip the norm reference testing, does it really make sense to do that? We do have our module completion survey, so you can uh, do this QR code or click the link. This one is number three, norm reference assessment supplement. We'd like to thank you for your time. If you have any questions or comments or feedback, feel free to contact us at any time. Uh, we hope you have a great day and a great coming weeks and look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.